Well, welcome. I'm sorry uh, to be a few minutes late in starting, but it's a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce this year's annual Sackler Lecturer, who is Mac Gallagher, or as his given name is, Roland Gallagher, but the world knows him as Mac Gallagher. Mac is a native of the Boston area, and as he told me all the different things that he has done in his career and what his progression was, I realized that in Mac, we have a one-man exemplar of the evolution of the field of pain medicine. So we know the phrase of ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. In Mac's case, his ontogeny began with primary care. And then he branched out a bit more to be doing family practice and psychiatry. When he was in primary care in Colorado, he actually gave anesthesia, he said. And as he worked more in primary care and rural psychiatry, he realized that many of the patients that were being followed, maybe half, were being followed because of pain-related issues. Mac became interested in the area of pain, and to call his career stellar is an understatement. Uh, everything Mac has done, he has built up and left a lasting legacy for, and the things that he has done span the creation of pain clinics, at Stony Brook and Penn, the assessment of outcomes, the starting of a brand new journal called Pain Medicine that now is one of the highest impact journals in the field, and most recently he's brought his fund of knowledge and wisdom to a major problem which might be termed a public health problem because of its magnitude. This has to do with the chronic pain conditions and related psychiatric morbidity in veterans coming from the battlefield. There is an enormous unmet need and before Mac joined that team to chair its working group on pain management, this was a largely unmet and fragmented need. Mac has advised the highest levels of the military and has created an amazing system in a very short period of time that achieves what people in civilian life have still not been able to achieve, namely continuity of treatment from the time of trauma through rehabilitation. Now I'm sure that story is not over yet, I'm sure every hurdle is not yet crossed, but Mac is the key person who has the fund of knowledge and who advises policymakers for the benefit of this major unmet public health need. So I will stop the introduction. The introduction could last an hour, but we have to leave some time for the talk. The talk itself is at least the 10th Sackler Annual Lecturer, and the people who have come to give these talks have come from all over the world, and they are beyond a who's who of the area of pain. So we're very privileged that Mac found time in a very busy schedule to come here today. So thank you, Mac. And welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, and, and thanks for coming out, um, Paniacs all, and, and maybe some people we might convert over uh, to pain care and, and pain interests. Well, Dan was overly generous, as he always is, um, a true gentleman and a scholar. I'll say some more words about that in just a minute, at his embarrassment. Does anybody know what this is? It's a cell, right? All right, well, at the risk of embarrassing Dan, um, that's a pain stem cell. And uh, I just want to, want to acknowledge that Dan Carr is one of the two or three pain stem cells in the, in the field. Almost everything I'm doing has something to do with Dan, and I will mention it as I go through my talk uh, about how he has been a friend, a colleague, uh, and an inspiration, um, as well as fundamentally creating opportunities and, and uh, connections for me and some of the other people I'll be talking about uh, in the field in terms of our work uh, that have allowed us to do some of these things. Uh, so it's a great honor to be here and be invited by Dan. He's a friend, a colleague, and, and respected worldwide, as you all know. Um, I don't want to list all the different things he's done here. You all know those, those things, so uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. Um, but I will mention them as we go along. I'm going to start with this quote. It's now Four years since I lay in the dirt, near death on the side of the road in Fallujah. I'm grateful for all I have, 
and proud of the things I've accomplished. In the end, though, I don't measure how far I've come by goals achieved or academic degrees earned or running trophies won. For me, what counts is that pain no longer rules my life. And I recommend if you want to hear the story of one of our veterans, one of our soldiers over there who was blasted out of his uh, Humvee, uh, lost a leg, um, almost lost an arm, was unconscious for three months, woke up, and is now finished college um, and uh, working in the VA system as a social worker. Um, it's a wonderful story because it's not just so this is what happened to me, but it's his mother, his wife, all contributing to this manuscript, this uh, wonderful tale of what it, a person goes through to recover from chronic pain. And now, he's, as I say, he's running in marathons and all those kinds of things. It's a wonderful story. Now, when we talk, start talking about the story of soldiers at war and recovering and getting back into their lives, when a war starts, you start talking about the battle itself. Everybody's interested in the excitement, the shooting, the armaments, et cetera. And then people start talking about the units, who's over there, what, what are they like, et cetera. And then you start thinking about who these people are at the end when they're injured and the stories start coming out about individuals. Well, that's really what some of this research is about. You start with military structures, organizations, then you start talking about care models, and then you start talking about learning from the actual individual cases you take care of and then generalize from your successes and learn from your failures. What I'm going to be doing today is reviewing some of the challenges of, of managing acute injury, acute pain after battlefield injury, and some of the transitions that uh, patients have to go through and the care system has to go through to get patients back to a stability in the uh, secondary and tertiary care systems, and then what happens to get them re into recovery in the community. Uh, it's, a, it's a long story, and it's hard to do in, in 40 minutes or so, but I'm going to try. Uh, to do that. Now we all know that, you know, th this is just a very simple slide showing you what, what makes a difference in terms of the quality of life of someone with chronic pain. And these are the factors that determine outcomes and we know all this. Uh, these aren't biological factors, they have to do with how a system is organized to deliver these kinds of um, interventions. So when someone has pain, no matter what it's caused, access to quality health care is important. Why? Because we don't want central centralization of uh, sensitization of pain. We don't, so, but we also want to deal with the impairments associated with pain and with the diseases or injuries causing pain. But then it's access, and here's where disparities come, come to mind. Um, access to high quality rehabilitation, and then some of the personal characteristics of the patients, their resilience. Now soldiers go through resilience training. You can actually train people to more resilience to manage their injuries, but coping skills, Social support, again, with a fragmented health system like we have now in the United States, it's very hard to bring those resources to bear on someone with chronic pain to get them better. So when you think about the public health problem of chronic pain, there are many causes. And I'm just going to focus today, I'm not going to really focus on education and training deficits, although they'll be part of my talk towards the end. But we'll, I'm going to talk about ineffective organizational models and some, how we're making some changes to change those models to more effective models. And what I'd like you to do is re refer you to a, a wonderful paper that just came out in, in pain medicine, uh, just to think if, uh, about people who think outside the box in terms of how to set up a system that's going to actually cost effectively take care of a population of patients in pain. This is from uh, Australia where a group of pain doctors decided that access to them was really limited and when someone got into them after a long waiting list oftentimes they didn't need a pain specialist they just needed exercises or some behavioral counseling <coughs> behavioral modification or physical therapy that there was no screening process to get the right people with the right level of complexity that needed their skills to them quickly and, and, and appropriately so they set up a system, a population-based system, where they actually had a training program ahead of time before they even got to the clinic to learn about pain. And they've wrote, written about their outcomes in terms of their cost savings, how it reduced the wait time at their clinic so that they actually took care of the patients they needed to at the level of need, and the rest went to primary care and did very well. So I, I want to refer you to those two papers. Now, the model that we're developing is a population-based model, and it's based on 
uh, the fact that you have to, our responsibility is for a whole group of patients. And the VA and the DOD, you can't kick someone out because they don't pay for your insurance. You know, you own these patients. So you have to take care of them. If they misbehave, they're still your patients. If you don't give them opioids, they'll go to the, you know, the, the hospital administrator. So you actually have to take care of the behavioral problems and the pain problems all together. So you have to set up a system that actually manages the entire population. And so obviously for a large population of patients, when you have 55% of your patients in the VA have chronic pain, the VA health system, you've got to have a system that works. Now you all know that, of course, in our general population outside the VA, chronic pain is also quite common. So you have to have a system that works. But it's got to be a stepwise system where you have a lot of self-care, and this is the medical home model, you've, you've read about it already, with self-care, community care, prevention, disease management, just like with a framing and heart study, they started off studying these folks and now we've revolutionized the way we think about our diets, our nutrition, our exercise, et cetera, and reduced the incidence of early heart disease. Similarly in pain, we have to think the same way. So in self-care and you know, self-management, there are a number of things, meditation, exercise, we talked about this last night at dinner, the importance of these things as being skills, fundamental skills for staying healthy, exercise, nutrition, social supports, very important. But primary care really needs to have evidence-based algorithms so we can standardize care instead of having the unworried variability that now exists amongst regionally and amongst uh, uh, primary care providers and specialists. And then secondary care has to be informed by research and evidence so it's a biopsychosocial integrated care approach that addresses the factors that influence outcome. And then finally, there are obviously subspecialty things, new developments, neuroremodeling, some of the very fancy new things that are taking advantage of our knowledge of neuroplasticity and neuromodulation and gene therapies. Now, in the beginning, uh, these are minor slides. I don't put up the really bad ones, the blast injury ones. But anyway, this is the typical kinds of injuries you get in polytrauma. And this is one of the first patients I took care of at the Philadelphia VA, a guy who lost his hand in Vietnam and never had anybody recognize his pain at all. He had uh, causalgia of his right hand, uh, he paints now with his left hand, and this is what it feels like. And then he paints what it's like to have pain in terms of effects on a person. And we know that pain has a whole lot of downstream effects on people. So as a clinician, when you're being confronted with chronic pain, you're not just being chronic confronted with the diagnosis of the actual pain generator itself, but also, of course, all the consequences of pain, including uh, as a health system, the social consequences, the health care costs, et cetera. So it's not only a personal catastrophe for, for patients when it's not well managed, not only is it affects their brain basically and all their behavior and their thinking, et cetera, and their relationships, but it's also a public health problem. And, excuse me, when you, in this current conflict, one of the new injuries uh, that we're having to deal with is the blast injury, where you have the combination of someone in a high fear environment, so they're already encoding that environment and in the memory systems, who has a brain injury as well, maybe mild traumatic brain injury, maybe major, like our friend Derek, who was unconscious for three months. And then you have multiple injuries from the blast itself that are pain generators. So you have all these things working together. And this is a typical case of a decorated guy who's had all these different injuries over a period of time in the service and he shows up at my doorstep in 2004 um, with all this stuff going on. He's on you know, three different anticonvulsants for seizures that are out of control. Turns out one of them is something he got from his family, uh, his community neurologist who, because there was no capacity to take care of them in the community at that time. There was you know, four, four years out of date. It was a, it was a, you know. So the point is that he was having seizures, uh, all these problems, he was on three different opioids and uh, had all these different problems. Typical kind of case, so this is what the VA was confronted with, and we had a workforce that was taking care of my generation of Vietnam veterans, people my age group who were old, had various diseases and conditions causing pain, but that's what the focus was, not these young people with these very complex problems. And the reason they came in like this is we survived, they survived. These kids survived, there's a 90% survival rate uh, in this war from these terrible injuries. And in fact, when you study the polytrauma patients, we call them, the ones with polytrauma like this, it turns out there's a 42% overlap 
comorbidity rate between traumatic brain injury, chronic pain, and PTSD. No surprise given the conditions. Um, this is a more typical case, though, because the polytrauma are, you know, they're maybe 10 percent. But we're talking about the average veteran coming in. This is more typical. Tank engineer, high school graduate, father of a two-year-old daughter, divorced, uh, kid lives out west. Uh, and he's got myofascial, nociceptive, low back pain, negative MRIs, negative neurological exam, poor biomechanics, can't stretch his, his muscles are tight. He's isolated, he's got mild P anniversary type PTSD around the time of the tank battle where he lost one of his buddies, he feels responsible. Um, he's hanging around and he's way overweight. Typical kind of a guy. Now, a year later, working closely sort of in a biopsychosocial model as an individual practitioner, because we didn't have our program set up, he's returned to work, turns out he was sort of a math guy who almost was a high, he was a high school dropout. He goes GED and was going to college. Um, but he was Viking independent, but we didn't have, I couldn't see him anymore because I was doing a new job. But the point is that this, is, this guy's going to have a long-term course where he's going to have to deal with some of these long-term issues. He's still got back pain, uh, he's still a little bit overweight, and he's still on Vicodin. And it's no surprise when you look at the comorbidity statistics of the veterans coming into our system now. 52% have chronic musculoskeletal pain. But look at the other numbers. So 52% here, but look at the other numbers. Mental, mental disorders, uh, PTSD, depression, substance abuse, et cetera, and neuropathic or neurological problems. So you've got a high rate of comorbidity in this incoming group. You can imagine the complexity here. We're not talking about a simple low back pain. It's got all these augmenting factors. And this is Congressman Murtha, who is very responsible for setting up some of the studies that we're doing now. Um, through grants, if you can't control their pain, you'll never be able to help them with their PTSD and depression. Murtha, by the way, used to go in the back door of Walter Reed, didn't have any photographers. Every week he'd make rounds on the units and seeing all the newly injured kid, kids, I should say, young, young men and women. Um, uh, he himself, of course, was a Marine and from Vietnam. So how do, how do you address these problems in a population? How do you deliver care that's performance-based based on biopsychosocial outcomes? You have to understand the causal models of disease and disorders, the mechanisms underlying these models, the formulation, the bio how do these things affect each other? What's the formulation and the evidence basis for treatment? This is a simple diagram. All those in the audience, the reason you're here is because you're a PANIAX probably, but the point is that you know, you know this, this is the, the, the cycle that, you know, that happens, the pathophysiologic cycle that leads to chronic pain here at the end where you have disability, pathology of disability. But this cycle here starts with the acute injury and then this process starts occurring in the periphery and in the spinal cord and in the brain, uh, activates psychopathology often, leads to disability, and disability leads to its own sets of pathologies. This is what we're up against. And obviously, a treatment approach that's going to work for this is an approach that really thinks about how do you stop it in its tracks right in the beginning? How do you stop this process from starting up in the beginning? So injury management, blocking or managing pain right in the beginning is very important. But then once it gets going, can you reverse any of these things? And your treatment plan really has to sort of map where in this stage things are. And of course, you can also go over and circle around here. So you can have acute knee injury. For example, I'll tell you about a study we're doing right now on acutely injured soldiers where they have to go back in for resurgeries because they have a blast injury, they have, need plastic surgery, they need a bone, they have a bone infection or whatever from uh, their earlier surgery. So you, all, you recycle through the cycle, so to speak. So you have to be thinking of this all, all along. So the key elements in the continuum of obviously our, of pain care are, are prevention, primary prevention to prevent injuries and the, you know, our body armor, helmets, good helmets, things like that. Secondary uh, prevention, and this is regional anesthesia, blocking the stimulus from getting in. If you're gonna go get surgery on your periphery, get a block, please. Continuous block is better. I know it takes longer, so it's not as billable, but you know, it's much more effective. Um, Reduce concurring augmenting factors like stress. Uh, tertiary prevention, once you've had chronification, which is a European word, it's not in our lingo, but I'm encouraging it in my journal anyway, because I think it's a, it, 
It's not chronic pain, it's a process, chronicification of pain. Um, restoring social networks is critically important, I'll talk more about that, and then obviously restore, reversing neuroplastic damage. So what's the system that we use? How do we tr get patients from, or soldiers from the battlefield back to safety and then back into a tertiary care environment where we can do the kinds of things we need to do? Um, this is Trip Buckermeyer, who is the hero of this story, um, who is a uh, forward-thinking military doctor at Walter Reed, who decided that he was going to go out there and he was seeing these patients coming into Walter Reed. He was going to go out there and see if he could block, do re regional anesthesia in the field. So he's in a field hospital blocking the guy with this leg here, who we'll talk about as we go along here, doing a pervert lumbar block. Uh, here's this guy uh, in the field hospital after the block's put in hitting it's a PCA block. Um, and over a period of time, for the whole hundred, uh, hundreds of these blocks, these patients do well. I mean, if they get their average, you know, pain belief is pretty good. Um, so we know it works. The thing is that this is, they're going through an experience as they make this transition from the battlefield. And don't forget, the brain encodes all these experiences. The brain is highly conditionable. Pain is the major conditioner of the brain just about. You know, that's why, you know, when you do laboratory studies, you use shock devices, et cetera. The point is that the brain is very conditionable, and the expectation of pain activates emotions. The anterior cingulate gyrus, where the emotional parts of pain are encoded and activated. And we're all laying down new memory, okay? So the hippocampus is generating new, the neuroscientists in the crowd will understand this, generating new, new neurons. If, there, if there's a new learning environment, they could be used effectively or uh, appropriately. Uh, if not, uh, they die. Um, fear drives a lot of this. The encoding of memory is, is driven by fear more than anything else, more appropriately. So you can imagine a fearful environment, being on patrol, being in a situation where your buddy's just been killed or something like that, and then you yourself get an injury. That's a perfect opportunity for encoding of memory and, and chronic pain and neuroplasticity. So survival first is the most important thing on people's minds. And this is the environment that these soldiers are transported in. You can imagine what it's like to be hooked up. There are a couple of nurses there trying to keep these guys alive while they're being transported from Iraq to Walter Reed, or to Langdell, actually. And if you're giving them morphine, you're worried about respiratory depression, right? So a peripheral nerve block is a much better op option because they, the patient can control it, they can be alive, they can talk and, and they can communicate. Um, we did a little study of this uh, at, at uh, Longstreet Hospital, a bunch of us from Penn and, and Walter Reed and the VA, where we looked at the pain and emotional outcomes during transport. And um, you can see that, you know, these are soldiers who tend, tend to sort of um, deny symptoms. They're, you know, pain is, is weakness leading the body. That's the theme in, in, in the military. So you, you see that even these guys were saying that some of them were worried, some of them are you know, anxious, et cetera, and they certainly have pain. Now the results of this study showed that there was that greater worry during transport and higher uh, were, were associated with worse pain and explained 72% uh, of the variance in average pain levels during transport. And I think this is important to think, is, is worrying a trait worth exploring similar to trait anxiety or catastrophizing that we know pr predicts pain disability uh, in chronic pain patients? Um, so is that a character trait or personality trait that somehow, or maybe an anxiety disorder that pre-exists going to war? Does chronic activation of stress centers facilitate encoding of pain in fear memories and central sensitization? These are some of the things, the hypotheses that we need to test. And should we test these ahead of time and do resiliency training? Well, actually, that's what's happening. They're doing resiliency training uh, in the Army now. Um, also, those getting peripheral nerve blocks had significantly better pain relief than those did not, even though their average pain levels were higher. That's why they got the blocks. But the point is that it looked like, at least in that environment, they were actually helping nerve blocks, as we suppose. Now here he is back at launch duel, and uh, he's had his leg operated on, and now he's, as you can see though, he's sort of grimacing, he's smiling for the camera. I think he was asked to smile on this one. There's, but there's a whole lot of different uh, 
models of pain care now, interventions on battlefield. One of them, which Dan Carr has had something to do with developing, which is the nasal ketamine spray, right, Dan? So these things are now being uh, considered as part of the battlefield toolbox, so to speak, uh, that can be used. Interesting, uh, paracetamol was being used by the British over in Afghanistan. So Trip was over in Afghanistan on a tour last year, saw how effective it was in reducing needs for opioids. And now we have IV paracetamol, of course, uh, or acetaminophen available for acute pain in hospitals, uh, which we didn't have just a year ago. So here they are leaving. Uh, now, now they're coming to Walter Reed. So they've made it through that 8,000 mile sort of emergency room to Walter Reed. Um, and in Walter Reed, again, using ketamine to see if it has any effects on limb injuries, uh, and surgeries and various other procedures being done in the acute phase of recovery in, in Walter Reed after they've made the transport. And indeed, interestingly, for patients with no phantom pain, the ketamine was effective, whereas if you had phantom pain or if you had lower levels of pain to begin with, they were not effective. So with no phantom pain, you saw a, a significant reduction in pain using uh, the, uh, the ketamine uh, intervention. Other acute pain treatments have been developed. Virtual reality uh, goggles have been developed in Brook Army Medical Center down in, in, uh, in San Antonio where they have the best burn center in the world because of what they've set up after this war for these terrible burns that come in. And they've been using these very expensive, unfortunately, virtual reality go goggles to help deal with, do the uh, dressing changes that are part, part of burn therapy. But also, uh, as you, those of you who are in pain medicine know, mirror therapy and neural remodeling is, is, is something that's being used. Um, social support and motivation is very important. They're, they're not removing these guys from their units. They're keeping them part of their units. They're going back and sometimes having desk jobs with their amputations while they're going through PT, uh, PT and rehabilitation. Uh, so, so social support and, and motivation is important. Bringing families over to lawn stool during the acute phases of recovery from the initial injury. There's a lot of that awareness now. This is the guy when he gets back to Walter Reed, okay? He's got his family there. Uh, look at his smile, it's a real smile now. He's sort of happy that he had pain relief before. Now he actually looks like he's relaxed and happy with his family around. And this is something, a reintegration of family and social supports. And we can't forget, of course, that healing relationships uh, are really incredibly important. My uh, residents and fellows used to say, Mac, you adopt these patients. And I said, that's right. I tell them that I'm not going to give up on them. We're going to work on this. It may take three or four years, but we're going to get you better and functioning. But you, know, you really have to take that attitude as a pain center and as a pain provider. Um, I think the medical home model, where you own the patient, but they're part of the, in participating in this case management system, is really the way to go. Uh, and that's what we're doing in the VA now as we transmit, transition to that model. So does early intervention make a difference, bottom line, to pain, to fear, anxiety, quality of life? Well, we know it works for uh, immediate suffering and acute uh, fear and anxiety. We don't know if it makes a difference in terms of long-term outcomes, in terms of prolonged pain, post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes, we do know, for example, if you're exposed to morphine early on after your initial injury, or you didn't get morphine, and I don't know why they didn't get morphine when they had an injury, but anyway, the ones who, who got morphine in that situation actually had lower rates of PTSD uh, in follow-up in psychiatric clinics, which is in there. It was a New England Journal article last year. I, I'm sorry I don't have the reference, but... Um, so obviously inter early intervention is going to make a difference, whether it's a chemical intervention uh, such as morphine, and maybe there's some a neurolog neurologist friend of mine, um, Bob Ruff, who's uh, uh, director of neurology for the VA, was telling me about some of the uh, adrenergic activation of morphine versus other opioids, et cetera, some things I didn't even understand about it. It has some alpha agonist uh, properties. Maybe that had an Im impact on, uh, on the PTSD uh, formation. So we decided to s uh, study this, and this is where, again, the stem cell, Dan Carr, comes in, where <laughs> Dan said, hey, I was down in uh, Walter Reed talking to some guys, and I think there's a guy you ought to meet down there. His name is Trip Buckenmeyer, because he's interested in acute pain. And I know you're interested in the phenomenology and the epidemiology of pain and his treatment. So why don't you guys get together? So I made a site visit down to uh, Walter Reed and, 
and um, met with Tripp, and, and then we developed this research team and, and got funded for this grant to study the impact of early, within the first 72 hours, uh, regional anesthesia intervention, peripheral nerve blockade, on longitudinal outcome as compared to the morphine, the group that just got morphine of the standard of care, which is the standard of care, by the way, since the Civil War, right? So they hadn't had a change until this war, and now we're doing all these other things. Um, so we're going to follow uh, these two groups. Uh, we're going to be able to get at their record. We have their, we'll look at all their injury and their document, all that, their acute care. And then uh, we're doing a longitudinal follow-up. And this, here's again another stem cell moment because we're using the TOPS, of course, which is the best quality of life instrument for following patients longitudinally in terms of how they actually do. And that was developed here by Dan, Bill Rogers, et cetera, from Tufts. Um, so uh, we'll see. Now, we have some outcomes now. Um, Rosemary Palomano, who's uh, the chief co-investigator of this from uh, UPenn, uh, gave our uh, first presentation of our first results, 24-month results, uh, of the brief pain inventory. Um, and here's the, uh, the pain right now. And you can see that the average pain at baseline, or at the, the initial uh, evaluation, which was, by, by the way, after the acute phase of treatment was over. So it wasn't right at injury. It was after the acute phase of treatment was over, and they were starting their rehabilitation. So they'd been stabilized at Walter Reed. They were no longer in surgeries. They were no longer an inpatient. Then they were evaluated at baseline. And you can see there's a, a, little, you know, a little bit of an improvement, but there wasn't too much to go. Already they were, uh, at least the initial evaluation, uh, they were, their, their pain right now was low. Their average pain, again, uh, was better. Um, what's interesting about this, this line, though, is that their worst pain, they still have episodes of pretty bad pain, you know, five, four, five, et cetera. Um, showing that these guys 24 months in are still having episodic incident pain. Um, it's clinically significant. And, and uh, this, again, is a group that tends to deny. And these are the patients, by the way, who have had severe limb injuries. So they've had all the attention and incredible treatment. I mean, they've had the, all the physical therapy, psychotherapy, et cetera, and they're still having difficulties. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the TOPS results. Um, from this study because so far we looked at six of 14 TOPS domains. Uh, pain symptoms, solicitous responses, extent to which uh, your spouse or significant other is taking over your role function. Don't forget role function is an important part of one's identity. Are you a person, a whole person, do you have a role in life? Um, and that's, that's an important outcome. Satisfaction with outcomes, fear avoidance, uh, again, an important part of what we do in chronic pain management is trying to get patients to start moving again, doing things again, because fear is the greatest, if you want to make a, a rat anxious and, and have them learn a new maze to get to the, the food, you put a little shock device and they're, they're anxious, they'll, they'll do anything to get around that device so they can get to the food. They won't go through the shock device unless you give them Valium or Benzodiazepine, right? <laughs> then they have what they call Dutch cards. They'll go through the device time and time again. They won't learn the new pathway which is why we don't like benzos. But, um, and then objective uh, family, social disability, and healthcare satisfaction. Now, we're using the original top studies of chronic pain populations, uh, both done here at Tufts and also out at um, Utah, uh, these two databases where we had chronic pain samples from clinics uh, that were published in uh, pain medicine. One of our first, actually our first issue, I think it was volume one. Yeah, in the first, first issue of pain medicine, we had Dan's uh, study and Bill Rogers' study. Um, and uh, these are just some of the, uh, the outcomes. Let's look at pain symptoms. You can see that, in, in fact, uh, these are a percent of responders falling within the established confidence, confidence intervals for chronic pain patients and those scoring better and worse. And you can see for pain symptoms, they're sort of in the same ballpark. And over on the right, um, satisfaction, they're sort of in the same ballpark. They're pretty good, it's pretty much either better or the same. But in solicitous responses, they're not, we're not doing so well. So 24 months out, these patients are still dealing with problems of role functioning, how they're relating to their spouses. Uh, sort of that part of pain rehabilitation, which has not been satisfactorily addressed. 
So what do we do with these folks when they come to the VA system with all these comorbidities and these uh, injuries? Um, well, here's a guy, here's the same guy, the guy who you saw through the operations. He's got an artificial leg. Here he is restored. He's giving uh, a presentation at the opening of the Acute Pain Research Center at Walter Reed, that's Dr. Buckenmeyer. Um, and he's been restored. He's back in his unit. He's actually uh, um, on, on, in, a, in a reserve unit now um, and has a job. So he's been fully restored, but again, through a tremendous effort by Tripp and his group. But in the VA, we had to come up with a new pain management strategy. This is Secretary Shinseki of the VA, who, was, as you know, uh, used to be Chief of Staff of the Army. Um, and the objective of our, of our approach is to develop a comprehensive, multicultural, integrated system-wide approach to pain management that reduces pain and suffering for veterans. Now, the bolded letters, comprehensive, multicultural, integrated, system-wide approach. So this is a systems approach rather than an individualized approach. So how do we do this in a system? So we wrote a directive. I was principal author of this. This is the VHA Pain Management Directive, which we laid out the strategy. And the strategy base is formed around a step care model of care, a population-based approach. But it requires an infrastructure, a pain infrastructure. Don't forget, pain is the poorest stepchild of every department, right? Mm -hmm. But we actually have an office in the VA central office right next to cardiology and surgery and anesthesia. We're, we're actually at the table now, which is nice. Um, and we, have, we report up the line just like everybody else. Um, pain management standards for treatment evaluation of outcomes and quality, outcomes and the quality of care and what we do and how we spend our resources is going to have to be determined by outcomes and we need clinical competence and expertise to achieve that. This is a, just a cartoon of the STEP model. Basically, we're really emphasizing most stuff has to happen in primary care, but you need to provide system support. You can't put a doc in the box sort of say and say take care of chronic pain. It just doesn't work that way. Think of some of the systems in, say, diabetes management, where you have nutritionists, nurse case management, chronic disease management, that kind of approach. That all has to be integrated into primary care. But as you know, what is the training? What's the average number of lectures a medical student gets in the United States on chronic pain? Anybody know? I think it's seven. I think at the vet school here, they have, I think the average in vet school is 75 hours of lectures. So seven hours for medical students, 75 for veterinary medicine students. So that's what I heard recently. Um, so we're dealing with a population of providers who don't know what they're doing, don't have education, all right? And yet they're going to be tasked with taking care of this huge bolus, 50% of the cases. It's a pretty daunting challenge. So we have to provide system support for these folks. And we'll talk a little bit more. And then we have to have reliable pain medicine and mental health consultation, et cetera. And then finally, for more severe patients, and those of us who had the experience of running a comprehensive pain rehab program, and those were paid for back in the way old days, know what it takes. To, you know, it takes an intensive biopsychosocial integrated approach to get someone back to functioning if they've lost their time at work. We had Stony Brook, we had um, you know, full-time pain doctor, behavioral psychologist, physical therapist, occupational therapist, voc rehab, we had a whole center with swimming pools, workstations, all that kind of thing, voc rehab. And it took a huge effort, like 12 weeks, to actually get it done. And we got 90% of the patients who came in had been out of work for two years average, were work ready by the time they, they finished. And only 60% were able to get work because it was a bear market in the 90s. But the point is that they were able to get much, 40% higher than those on a waiting list who couldn't get in. So the point is that these things work if you put the effort into it. When I was down at Brook Army after the war started soliciting their participation in this grant, I talked to the head burn surgeon who's the top guy in the field. Um, and, and we were going around making rounds on these devastating injuries. Half the face burned off, I mean, these incredible injuries. I said, God, how do these guys do? He says, you know, if you give them what they need, you know, the social rehabilitation, the vocation, you give them a role, a function, give them a sense of social support. They do pretty well and their families do pretty well, but you've got to give them all that stuff. They actually have to reorganize their brains, their minds to this new reality. So it's a matter of putting the resources in to be successful. <clears throat> um, we have a whole structure. I mentioned that. This is a very 
coordinated, organized structure. There are 153 um, facilities in the VA. Each facility is required to have a pain point of contact. Each facility is required to have a pain committee. Each VISN, which are the regional centers, and there are 23 of them, is required to have a, a pain point of contact who organizes the facilities in their VISN to develop these standards and to use the national standards to implement them in their local settings and to organize training programs, et cetera. It's obviously multidisciplinary and involves everybody involved in the pain field. But obviously, this kind of thing requires a self-management approach to start with. And so there's a big emphasis in the VA system to develop self-management programs. This management system is informed by the chronic illness model. There's a lot of encouragement. We call them, we have PAC teams, patient-aligned care teams to manage patients with chronic pain or any chronic disease, but chronic pain is now one of the, uh, at the forefront now in VA's strategy. And it's a promotion of healthy lifestyles and behavior, of course, and adaptive uh, learning. This is just an example of the kind of, this was yesterday in the news. I saw this on Medscape or something like that, or the VA, the, the VA actually saw this. This is a PTSD monitor. This is the kind of thing, this is a new generation. These kids all know how to use all this stuff. I mean, we get out our Blackberries, fumble around. This is all part of the way they communicate with texting and social networks. So this is the kind of thing we're starting to use. Uh, and Bob Kearns, who's the national director for pain, is a psychologist at Yale New Haven, and he's been doing this research on self-efficacy management, self-management for years, and now he's starting to use do grants with this kind of thing with pain. It's pretty exciting. Um, we're also developing an evidence-based approach to disease management and the step care model. This is a, a study that was published in JAMA. See DAPCHA out of Portland, and the VA there did the study looking at a sort of a phone assistance model for primary care providers and showed a big change at 12 months. Uh, these are the changes here in terms of the change from baseline. The yellow bar, the orange bar is the treatment group, and the uh, green bar is the treatment as usual group. For the, the yellow bar is the intervention group, and the green bar is the, but you can see a big difference, and the cost savings were tremendous in a, in a program like this. Patients really did better, and the, the changes were sustained over time. Um, so this is an evidence-based sort of psychotherapy medical uh, assistance advice model to the primary care provider and the patient, and it worked. And there are other models like that that have been developed all in the VA system because we can do that. We can follow patients longitudinally. It's like the Atkins study. I don't know if you ever saw the studies of Atkins. They did the study, the original study at, at Penn and the VA at Penn, the VA Penn, and they had a, uh, uh, an outcome uh, report uh, at a year, which I happened to be at when I first moved there, and Half the patients in the Penn study had dropped out of the study at six months, so they, they had to take last observations forward. Um, half the study, the patients in the VA uh, group had dropped out at six months as well. But guess what? At one year, we still had the VA data because they were coming in for other things, and we had the database. So the VA data showed that the Atkins diet was better than the low-fat diet one year, whereas the Penn data didn't show that. There was no difference because they had to have last observation you know, forward as the uh, outcome. So the point is that the VA has these aver uh, advantages. What is the toolkit you need for a primary care provider? Well, there's a whole bunch of things that we're doing, and I want to just emphasize a couple of things. We have back pain guidelines. We have a national opioid pain care agreement, which is now being discussed with the bioethicists. Uh, and I say discussed advisedly because they disagree with the idea of having any kind of agreement that's signed. So now we're moving to a written consent for having opioids, which is an interesting and informed consent procedure, just like if you were going into the OR to get a procedure on your spine, which is interesting. So we don't know where this is going to end up, but the key thing is to reduce unwarranted variability. When I first came to the VA in um, 2004, I remember seeing a guy at a conference who was a primary care provider in Seattle. And I said, well, what's it like here, you know? And he said, well, you know, it's amazing. In Mississippi, where he was in Jackson, Mississippi, eight of us would sit around a table and argue for two hours as to whether we could prescribe Darvon for a patient. When I moved to Seattle, 50% of my panel were on long-acting opioids. <laughs> 
So there's, you have tremendous variability in the system, and that's true, you know, you know the Dartmouth studies, and there's tremendous variability. So one of our jobs is to reduce that unwarranted variability by, first of all, having data registries so we can follow outcomes. But we already have, since we have electronic medical record, we already have a lot of those outcomes which, can, which we can follow, but also to provide resources for the primary care provider and the pain providers to take care of patients. Um, Opioid renewal clinics, has anybody heard of opioid renewal clinics? This was a nice little intervention we did in Philadelphia, which was done before I got there, but I just came there and said, hey, let's study what this, this is very successful. So we looked at this group of patients who had come in who had aberrant behavior, aberrant behavior while on opioids in primary care, or they had risks. They had prior history of substance abuse or a psychiatric history. So they're at risk for having problems with opioids. They were referred to this pharmacist who had a script, a, a structured interview approach with urine drug screens and an opioid pain care agreement. That was all part of the clinic. And if you follow these for a year, 40% of the patients with aberrant behavior settled right down and did fine and got the treatment they needed and have continued to do well. 100% of the patients with risk did well. 100%, not 80%, but 100%. And this has become a best practice for the entire VA health system being used throughout the VA system because primary providers are taken off the hook. They get structured support for providing pain care. And the patients who normally wouldn't get opioids because they had a barrier behavior are getting them when they need them and are doing well. So these are the kinds of system support that we're developing as structures to help patients, uh, uh, pr providers work with patients who have chronic pain and are dealing with these comorbidities. Another problem we have is with collaborative care models. Pain doctors can't stay up in the clinic and just do procedures on their waiting list of procedures. They have to actually work in a dynamic, fluid model of care with their primary care providers. We have our pain clinic in the primary care clinic. They can come down the hall and ask a question. Uh, we can go down and do an exam with them down the hall. Go on down, let me help me do a back exam on this patient. So, it's very important for the primary, for the pain doctors to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Uh, this is the Behavioral Health Lab. This is de developed by David Oslin, one of my co-investigators on our study uh, with Walter Reed, who's developed a behavioral lab program, which is a, a, a telephone-based intervention where if a patient screens positive uh, or says positive, I have pain or I have anxiety or stress or family stress, they get actually an interview by a skilled, trained psychologist uh, in a lab behavioral laboratory, in a phone, phone laboratory, and then recommendations are given to the patient or the provider based on that, that um, evaluation. It could be patient suicidal does need to see someone right away, or it could be patient needs to go into some CBT for chronic pain, or the patient needs anxiety control training or whatever. But it's a very specific uh, uh, program, and, and he's done research, and it really does save money, but it also implements that step model very nicely, because you can identify before the patient is even seen for the follow-up visit what the problems might be and how the comorbidities may affect outcomes. Now, I'm going to shift from the VA now to the Pain Management Task Force for the Army, which was set up by, the, by General Schoonmaker, who is the Surgeon General of the Army. Um, to basically say, we gotta do something about pain. Our soldiers are, are you know, taking too many opioids, they're doing this, that, and we, we have to do something. So they, they chartered a six month task force. I was invited to be one of the pain experts on the task force. And uh, Kevin Galloway was the, was, the, was the nurse who ran the task force, incredibly capable guy. Um, and we met uh, for three, uh, three day retreats, we made, uh, 29 site visits around the country. Um, and the idea was to standardize care for patients in the continuum of care from the battlefield all the way back to the VA and to recovery in the community. Um, notice the membership on the uh, task force. This was not a group of anesthesiologists or pain medicine doctors or pain or PT or nursing. This was everybody who has anything to do with what's going to happen with these patients and what's going to make them better. So there's an integrated task force with all these people. People who aren't on this list, by the way, are people like information technology, the people who do the medical records, operations people, 
we actually had generals coming to this thing. And we'd sit there in this really fancy place out in Virginia countryside and go at each other for three or four days. It was great. It was one of the great best experiences I've ever had in uh, my career. And we came up with a, a um, and, and we made 29 site visits to best practices around the country. Um, uh, I couldn't persuade him to come to Tufts, but I think Dan was still in private uh, doing his, his other thing at that point. So. But no, seriously, we are talking, uh, Dan and I are talking about this, uh, ways of bringing in uh, that wonderful um, training program that you have here. Because one of the things we discovered was this tremendous lack of capacity for managing pain. And no one, we really need to train up uh, the providers, the nurses, the people who are going to take care of these patients in the field. Um, these are, you know, note that we also went to Germany um, uh, over here. So the point is we went around the country to look at best practices. And then we came together and wrote this 160-page this report. Uh, you can find it. You can just Google Army Pain Management Task Force report. It's quite a remarkable document. Um, I uh, had a lot to do with writing it up, uh, putting on my editorial hat. So. These are the, the major recommendations. There are 105 recommendations, and obviously I can't go through them all. They're very detailed. I mean, extremely detailed about what we need to do, and now we're starting to do it. We're actually rolling it out. Um, but the point is that, you know, we need to change the culture of pain awareness. And this, this requires, it's like having your hospital administrators in the room with you while you talk about pain strategy. The generals are onto this now. They're actually involved with this because they know the effect of pain on their re work readiness of their force, their workforce. They understand that now. So they're very much involved in this. Um, and it re requires everybody to be involved. We need to give them the tools and the education, uh, and we have to implement the step care medical Mahone model. Um, the structure that's been developed and just been now uh, financed, so, so to speak, uh, stood up is the Defense and Veterans Pain Management Initiative. This is the child of Trip Buckenmeyer, my colleague and friend. Um, it requires the integration of a whole bunch of experts at the, in the pain area, but all the people you saw in the task force are going to be part of this to develop a place, a placeholder, you know, a place where actually all this can take place, sort of a command center for developing all these programs that will affect the military and the VA. Uh, in terms of doing research and integrating care. So, back to my theme, reorganization of pain care, neuroplasticity to health system plasticity. The concept of plasticity is important to the process of healthcare reorganization as it is to our understanding of the neurobiology of pain. The brain responds structurally and functionally to environmental conditions and exposures such that neural networks and their dysfunction can be manipulated experimentally and by specific treatment procedures, and we're starting to learn how to do that, to reverse or modulate the pathophysiologic plastic changes that have occurred in response to pain signals and comorbid, comorbid environmental factors interacting with psychological states. Similarly, social systems as expressions of our collective executive functioning, hopefully that's still working in most of us, and social cultural values and intelligence can also be manipulated experimentally by carefully constructed strategies. And so that's what this overall strategy approach is, uh, to encourage evolution to a better and more functional state. The good news that is that when you're in a, have a population-based approach and a contained health system where all the costs are shared by the entire system and there's no cost shifting outside the system, then to get the best bang for the buck and get the best outcomes, you have to think through and evolve your system to respond to the realities of those costs and the need to improve outcomes. So that's what we're doing in the VA and military. Uh, hopefully we'll work together well and closely, um, and hopefully we'll come up with a lot of answers that will be helpful to society at large as our entire society tries to evolve its health system in a positive way to take care of patients with pain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mac, for that in really inspiring talk. And I, uh, there's a lot of thoughts that go through one's mind when one hears about this. It wouldn't be the first time that lessons learned from battle or warfare wind up being applied to the benefit of many aspects of civilian life. 
So we have time for some questions, and thank you for hearing like a real professional speaker to the minute of the time. Are there any questions for, for Mac that uh, people have? Well, I'll start. Oh, there's a question. Yeah, Maureen. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take the last question first um, because I just know I just the, the, the figure three to four. Can you the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the last question was um, the the trillion dollar war, which is a book written by Joseph Stieglitz and uh, Dr. Bell, is it? Bill. Uh, Bill. 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 Um, about the costs of this war, and I think there was a Harvard Business School study, I believe that estimated, this was like three or four years ago, they estimated the cost of these casualties and the care of these soldiers afterwards uh, to be three to four trillion dollars over their lifespan. And that was a very conservative number. So yes, there are going to be tremendous costs, which is why the investment, putting your money into this incredible rehabilitation that's necessary, this very, very high tech combined with high intensity, personal intensity, rehabilitation is so important. So you can, instead of going this way and becoming a dependent veteran, you go this way and become a member of the community, your community again, maybe using veteran services as well, but with a job, instead of requiring, you know, depending on a pension. Um, so there's a, there's a lot, of, lot going on in terms of social interventions. For example, now they have a whole intervention program for families and for spouses where they actually go out to the home instead of having them come in and have to find a parking space. I mean, it's, there's a whole lot going on in terms of social reintegration. So when we had our first big conference, a 3,000 person conference of the VA and military, you know, social reintegration was one of the tracks. Pain was a track too, which was nice. But social reintegration was one of the tracks, mental health, social reintegration. So we had a strong social work component contingent. Whereas when the war first started, I told the social workers who were screening new soldiers coming in in 2004 and 5, said, if they have pain, just bring them down to my office. Walk them down. Why? Because they were waiting in six weeks for a primary care provider who probably never learned anything about pain anyway. So the point is they would walk them down. Now it's totally different. They get right in to see us. They have a whole primary care team that takes care of the initial screening for pain. I mean, it's totally different. The other question was about, the earlier question was about research opportunities in the VA. VA has a, a, a pretty robust pain research uh, portfolio, again, somewhat based on um, um, so a, when I first got there, we got a small grant from a pharmaceutical company actually to put together a pain research working group, uh, which we did. Uh, Bob Kearns, who is a distinguished behavioral medicine researcher in, at Yale New Haven, VA um, has led that group and we've from that evolved a whole bunch of grants including the one I just described to you the one we're doing with Walter Reed was one of the outcomes of that in fact I was 
I called Dan from the meeting. He doesn't remember this. We were down in Fort Lauderdale, this meeting of pain researchers from the VA. And I called Dan, and I told him about what we were trying to do, and he sort of said, yeah, yeah, this, this guy, Buckenmeyer, and yeah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I followed up on his call to me about a month or so earlier. So there is an opportunity. Now, if, you, if you're a, a, an academic researcher, you have to, to, actually, you know, to actually enter a, a grant to the VA as a principal investigator. You actually have to have a five-eighths appointment. So you have to have a colleague in who's got at least a five-eighths appointment in the VA to actually be the PI. However, if you have a PI from the VA and you're not employed by the VA, they can write you into the grant as a VA employee. You can come in under that grant. So there are various ways to do this. Um, we have a lot of basic science research. Um, I'm blocking the guy at Yale who does all that wonderful uh, uh, basic research on neuropathic pain. Anyway, there are some, uh, uh, um, there's a guy at Michigan who's doing the uh, smart virus research on cancer pain. Um, anyway, so there are some people who are actually doing basic science research, but the, the pain portfolio and research and all the portfolios which are shifting over to implementation research. We're much more interested in how can we set up this model, measure its impact, meaning the model I was just talking about, to show that structural changes in the system actually improve outcomes. So there's going to be a shift of monies into that area, I think, uh, in terms of research, systems research. Dan and I were talking about this earlier, about how his sort of public health type approach or, or program department can really help create a, a, a training intervention that's desperately needed in the military and the VA right now because we don't have those resources and capabilities now. So there are ways of thinking about, about research that way. Uh, was there another part of that question? Hyperalgesia yeah. and opioids. Opioids are a huge concern. You see it in the newspaper. I get emails every day from someone higher up that I need to respond to about that in terms of some a senator or congressman. What's the VA doing about this? So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of research going on about opioids. Um, and um, it's a very important area. I live in data. That's why we're working so hard right now to make these changes and demonstrate their impact. We have two years because the funding in 2013 will have a whole new government or you know, whatever. But the point is that we've got a year to have. One of the things we're doing is we're reorganizing the whole specialty care services in the VA health system to model after this program called the ECHO program in New Mexico where provider teams, like you might have in a multidisciplinary team here, Tufts, you know, the psychologist, the pain specialist, PT, OT, social work, et cetera, sit around a table, pharmacist, and talk to providers in rural or inaccessible areas that don't, can't get their patients into the, the tertiary care center and train them over a period of time, a year's period of time, with many lectures and actual case uh, supervision, like a, like a residency program almost, as they see their cases. And they've been able to show, demonstrate, the improvement of outcomes of not only the, of the knowledge and skills of the providers on the other end who are getting this training, but also the patients do better. And they don't travel two or three hundred miles to see the tertiary care doctor. So they save money, gas, etc. Uh, it's a very successful program. It's been shown to be successful in hep C, diabetes, pain management, and the nice thing is pain was the first program out of the box. We were organized enough so we're actually now leading uh, the whole re reorganization to the SCAN project. It's called SCAN ECHO. Um, I went out there and spent two days. It was unbelievable. It, it was just, it reminded me, as Dan mentioned, I was, used to be the traveling biopsychosocial doc in, in Vermont, going around to community hospitals, training providers how to integrate 
psychiatry into family practice. And it's the same thing, but using video technology. Um, it's really remarkable, and these people love it. It's the providers, they come on for two hours every week. And you have to be there 80% of the time to get your credential at the end of the uh, year. So it's a, but we need a credential that uh, people can come to and get so that people, they, so the military and the VA know that the person has a credential. We have pain medicine boards, but we don't have anything for the primary care provider or the nurse or whatever who, you know, needs a certificate saying that they have special training. Um, so the question is, yes, we have to show out, outcomes, and we're really tasked and stressed right now to do that, and we're really working really hard to do that, organized, so we can do that. I think there's time for one last question, and there is only one last question. And then let me remind you, as you exit, Wendy Williams, our associate director, who uh, is to be complimented for making a lot of these arrangements, will be collecting your evaluations. She's right outside the door when you do that. So one last question. You mentioned the pain uh, that directed to the VA and part of that was the primary care uh, education training. So the way that stands as far as rolling off the, the part of the initial? Yeah, that, that uh, we had a, that's part of this whole scan echo program. Uh, I just uh, was tasked uh, last week to develop a, a series of 30 lectures. We, you know the EES is the, in the VA they have this educational office program that runs all educational programs for CME and CNE, continuing education certificates. So we have to come up with a standardized curriculum. Fortunately, again, the stem cell here, fortunately I just finished the second edition of the Cousins Car Fast Facts on Chronic Pain. And I work with uh, Michael Cousins, uh, Dan was involved in his business venture, so he couldn't do it, so he handed it off to, to Mac. And um, so we just finished it, it just came out, and I just had the table of contents, and I went right down it and sent it out to everybody with some more, more process, learning how to do things, not just content, not just, you know, neuropathic pain and leg pain and cancer pain, but, but more processing. But the, the point is, it was right there for me. It was like, here it is. So we are actually developing a curriculum that's going to have to go through 508 compliance, going to have to go through all those things the VA makes us do so that everybody can read it, understand it, um, and then it's going to be a standard curriculum that will be rolling out. And, and, and as part of it, there will be, there'll be part of the curriculum will be collaborative care models. How do you evolve your system to develop collaborative care? Um, clinical reasoning skills, biopsychosocial formulation, I mean, those are part of the model now. So that if you're a pain doctor, it's not good enough to know where to put the needle or write a script. You actually have to know how to create a collaborative program with primary care providers and neurosurgeons and psychiatrists, you know, put it together and run it. So, um, uh, but primary care is, uh, is really has to be, we have to develop the educational program. So we're starting on that. Well, you can buy fast facts, look it up online. <laughs> yeah. uh, the comment earlier about how this you know, knowledge for the civilian sector could be a byproduct, but uh, from what I understand and stats I've seen is most uh, veterans, new veterans coming home to separate from service are actually seeing civilian providers. So it's yeah, there was a really interesting model for this called the National um, NIPC. I can't remember what it stood for. NIPC it was a, it was a actually it was a pharmaceutically funded group of of pain experts who got together to create a curriculum for neuropathic pain and then for opioid management of pain, and we sat around for you know three days, two or three times a year, and argued over the evidence and what was right and you know, trying to keep you know all pharmaceutical influence out of the way. They kicked them out of the room. We came up with this core set of slides. And, and then you'd go out and give a primary care lecture, or you'd tailor your lecture to whatever the audience. If you're talking to a group of orthopedists, you'd tailor a little of that. But you had your core slides that were really top quality slides that had, were evidence-based, and then you could mess around with them. That's what we're trying to do here. We're going to do the same thing, and, and that could be exported to anybody, really. Um, but the good news is we have a lot of slide slides already, and Dan probably has a thousand talks. I have a, we all have hundreds of talks on our computers, 
that we're going to borrow from. So we'll be able to put together these slide sets that will be available in a, in a curriculum. But I think, for example, Dan's program is another kind of opportunity that's out there in the civilian sector. Most of the vets go to what? Most of the vets go to civilian care, not uh, right. the VA. Right, exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I hope you will join me. Uh, we'll, uh, we can hang out there a little bit at the end. And uh, I hope you'll join me in thanking Mac for coming out of an unbelievably busy schedule, jettering around the world, doing things special. I guess I say shout out to uh, Christina Spellman from Mayday, who traveled up from New York to see this. We're very grateful. And to all of you who took time out of your very busy days to, to hear about an extremely important problem that's only going to get more important with time. So thank you very much, Mac. Thank you.